Hello, my name is Andrew Gary and welcome to Seismic Sound Off, in-depth conversations in applied geophysics. In this episode, I speak with Nishak Saxena on advancements in image processing and machine learning. June's The Leading Edge highlights these topics and showcases methods to achieve meaningful geological results while reducing costs and increasing speed. Nishak served as a guest editor. Dr. Nishak Saxeno works as a research petrophysicist at Shell. His interests include all aspects of theoretical and computational geophysics. Nishak also pioneered the work on generating benchmarks for the digital rock physics technology. He received his PhD in geophysics and seismology from Stanford University. SEG awarded him the J. Clarence Karcher Award in 2016. Gary Mavko, in his citation, stated, Through his passion, creativity, and good nature, Nishak Saxena has helped to raise the bar in rock physics research. I believe that, with Nishak and others of his generation, the future of geophysics is in good hands. Nishak joins me next. So I wanted to start with sort of a basic question here. What is image processing, especially as it relates to geophysics? Image processing is a subfield of signal processing that can overcome various limitations of the original image and can allow us to extract meaningful features. So that's the broad definition there. Basically, any analysis performed on an image of a rock or of the subsurface can be improved with high quality image processing. In fact, uh, perpetual improvements in imaging and computational technologies are positively disrupting every single discipline of geoscience. Rocks and structures are now routinely imaged at different scales using various techniques, including seismic for uh, for large scale problems, X-ray tomography, optical microscopy, electron microscopy, and magnetic resonance imaging are just a few examples of different kinds of uh, imaging techniques we use that require different kinds of image processing. Rapid advancements in image processing are helping us to see geology that had remained unseen in lab measurements. Moreover, these tools are making us confront the nature the way it really is, instead of guessing how it might be and oversimplifying the microstructure that we were not able to see earlier. So good image processing tools are required to help us see better into the rock. While many challenges exist, obviously, the heartening fact is that both imaging and computational resources are steadily improving, and I see no reason to stop at this point. You answered my next question, and that one with the range of methods in image processing. Uh, one phrase that I'd, or not even phrase, I guess it's a discipline or subject matter that I'd never heard of was digital rock physics. Could you explain a little bit of what that consists of? Sure. So digital rock physics operates on the simple idea that it is possible to image a piece of rock that can come from a whole core, sidewall core, or even a drill cutting. As these are expensive to take out from the earth, we can image these small rock pieces and be able to predict properties of complex rocks, how the rock might flow, how the liquids in the rock uh, might move around, or how it might uh, respond to sonic vibrations. All those interesting physical phenomena we can predict with numerical simulations run on images of rocks. Right now, we acquire micro CT image that can be used to compute properties directly on the microstructure. So that's what the uh, digital rock technology is, is all about. Now, image processing is a crucial step in predicting properties using digital rock, as this step translates what our machines or simulators see as pores or minerals or as a rock microstructure. Incorrect or geologically inconsistent pore scale images can lead to misleading answers. That's, I think, quite intuitive to think about. This ambiguity is often a result of limited image resolution and the noise in the image that you have to overcome with, uh, with advanced image processing algorithms. So there were quite a few papers in the special section on digital rock technology as we see steady improvements in image processing, steady improvements in uh, imaging by itself, 
there seems to be a more slot curve for uh, for how how large we can image with micro CT, and there are interdisciplinary efforts from medical imaging which are translating now into geoscience applications, which have uh, really uh, excited the whole endeavor of imaging at the port scale. Now, there are limitations, as I said, uh, but we hope that we can overcome these limitations by supplanting geologic rules into the mix. Are those, so there, there were three papers that focused on using 2D images from thin sections of rock. Is that what you mean? Is that using digital rock physics? Um, is that the method discussed in those papers? That's part of it. Okay. In fact, uh, 2D optical microscopy uh, and the images that we get uh, are often also known as thin section images, 2D thin section images. And these have been used by the energy industry for decades now. And they do form a part of, uh, of digital rock workflow. Uh, in, a, in a classical digital rock workflow, you don't need to have just 2D images. You can also use a 3D image to compute properties. But these 2D images can also be used for such an analysis as these are cheap, easy to acquire, and do capture sufficient geologic details for, for analysis. Uh, thin sections are thus very useful, especially since uh, 3D micro CT images are still quite expensive and time consuming to acquire. So you just give you a perspective on that. Uh, you know, currently, a good quality 3D micro CT scan would take between eight hours to 12 hours to get a good scan. On the other hand, a 2D image, a thin section can be prepared in a few minutes uh, if you really get down to it. It's more the human effort to make the sample and uh, prepare the sample. In the last five decades, I think we have acquired, uh, I would say thousands and thousands of thin sections for different reservoirs. And so this database exists already uh, in for various companies, it exists. And uh, if you can extract meaningful information from 2D images, that's very useful. And that's what we see in the three papers that uh, were published um, in the special section, as they have used uh, 2D images to extract, uh, uh, the, the result seems very promising and uh, upbeat. So I look forward to how this field might evolve when we start using more and more of the information that we have in 2D images. What does the term ground truth mean? Ground truth essentially means to know what the benchmark is. If you have an image acquired, do you know if that Im image is a true image uh, before processing or after processing that actually exists? So to refine that answer a bit more, uh, if you imagine that uh, you take a, take a picture of a sphere uh, and uh, that's a grayscale image you've acquired, you compare that with the known sphere that, that you may have taken to begin with. So if you compare the two cases and you're able to establish that the image is correct, that's what the ground truth would mean in this case. And it's an important aspect of all image processing algorithms because you are essentially filtering a signal and that does distort the image ever so slightly. It's important that you can verify that any given algorithm is reproducing what you began with. Now you cannot do that for a real rock because there is no benchmark or known ground truth for a real rock, but for idealized ore shapes and grain shapes. For example, if you imagine a bunch of ball bearings mixed together like a sphere pack, then you have an idea once you have an image that the, the grain size or the sphere size should be this much. And you can do all the filtering and image processing and recompute the grain size from the image and compare with what you know as the ground truth. Berg et al. was, they had a figure in their paper looking at an overview of image segmentation methods. And I was struck by just how many methods were listed and it even noted that this was an incomplete list how well scientifically understood are all those methods that were being highlighted in that paper? So this is a good question. Uh, there are indeed numerous segmentation algorithms. There's a whole, also a new generation of uh, machine learning tools that are just coming up. Uh, the primary challenge is to generate sufficient number of benchmarks or ground truths to validate uh, efficiency 
complexity of these algorithms, as I spoke before. Nature can surprise us with extreme complexity, and thus we must constantly improve our segmentation methods. And that's why there, there's a whole generation and a variety of different methods currently being used. Because what might work for, a, for imaging a, a teeth, a tooth, uh, might not really work well for a rock because of the different uh, modalities present in a real rock microstructure. So we are developing complicated segmentation algorithms that can be computationally demanding, but we must first aim for accuracy and be able to recover the actual microstructure with image processing and, uh, and different kinds of image segmentation methods before we think about the speed as a, as a factor. So computation power is not really a big problem at this point. It's more the algorithm that we often struggle with to extract the right, right microstructure from an image. That makes, that makes sense. Speaking of, of machine learning, I, two of the papers in this special section explored machine learning. And, and one of the papers especially almost struck me as something spy-like in what they were talking about. The Tian and, and Dangle showcased object detection and provided an image in there of highlighting men and women on a street and how machine learning can detect the, the differences there. How is something like that, that technology, being utilized in geophysics? So it's common knowledge that significant advancements have been made in the field of machine learning in the last decade, uh, primarily due to the abundance of data. So it's impacting, or uh, the word that's used in, in Silicon Valley is, is disrupting the way we do uh, business of different kinds, uh, including self-driving cars is one example of how rapidly the landscape is changing. Uh, image processing is also being benefited by these advancements and is a topic of active research. An important input for machine learning, although for as it relates to geoscience, is a label set or a ground truth of training images. So you require thousands and thousands of training images to really make a computer understand if this is the image that, uh, that can be used to extract meaningful attributes. And such a database can be built, but it's really time consuming to build a database that can comprise of labeled images. Uh, so that's the uh, unique thing about uh, application of machine learning in geoscience, because we don't always have the labeled image. We need to really get down to it and work with a geoscientist who can go and label the images, uh, learning from the past experiences and drawing from that and be able to identify that this is a mineral, this is a pore, for example, using micro CT images or on a larger scale of seismic, you can, you can draw uh, by hand sometimes what a trap looks like and be able to train a, a learning algorithm on that. So those are advancements that are happening, uh, but are uh, held back by the lack of labeled data that we have. Uh, it's, it seems kind of counterintuitive because in oil and gas industry, we have quite a bit of data, but uh, not labeled often that can be used by a machine learning algorithm directly. So that has to evolve as much as the algorithms themselves. You mentioned self-driving cars, and I feel like this is a good example of, of this uh, and the disruption you're talking about. Is machine learning ex widely accepted right now in, in the geophysics field? I think machine learning will eventually become a routine part of image analysis or geophysical applications. Many time intensive jobs or tasks such as segmentation, feature extraction, uh, structural interpretation, spatial correlation analysis, rock property computations will be eventually accelerated using machine learning. So it's more on the ev evolution side as it relates to geoscience than an established practice. But as I see that it will surely free up more time for experts to, to spend more time on making quality decisions rather than doing repetitive tasks. So the promise is already there for us to, to realize and to move forward. Uh, I would be cautious in saying that it is not a really an accepted field, but I would say that it's being researched on actively. It's a very fast evolving field. 
and the the promise that it has made is on reducing cost making us more efficient in the way we do things and also be able to explore phenomena that we couldn't explore with theory i mean a crazy example would be to predict micro seismic events or even earthquakes given that we are not always able to analyze all the data that we see in front of us but uh, a computer algorithm a deep learning algorithm perhaps could do something like that perhaps could learn from the data that we've acquired over decades and decades and give us more consistent answers than our theories have been able to conjure up at this point so to answer your question it's an evolving field with rapid advancements being made uh, it's not yet fully accepted uh, as we lack the labeled images and data sets to really constrain that uh, but i am quite optimistic that in the next uh, decade or so we'll see uh, some significant contributions coming from machine learning and uh, and deep learning to be more precise what prompted your own interest in learning about programming you were kind of ahead of the curve in in a lot of ways in, in your studies and your background it has to go back to this drive that i have that i want to be quantitative in when you are doing geoscience it's not always possible to be quantitative and that really prompted me to learn programming at a very early age when i was uh, just getting into geoscience programming right now is an important aspect of being able to translate information to the next person in the value chain process whatever that value chain process might be and it's different for different businesses for the energy industry it's about translating information from the side of rock physics or petrophysics to the next person in the value chain process which is the reservoir engineer and that is where i think programming skills can really impact uh, the way you do you you go about uh, your daily business so any young person out there uh, thinking about uh, doing geoscience for future i strongly recommend that you give a good thought to what might be the best way to proceed and i think in that uh, in that line of thinking you must include programming and coding as the as a tool that can help you to get the best out of your uh, your endeavors and uh, be able to translate information to the next person in the value chain process you've mentioned several times you see you know over the next decade this field evolving probably pretty rapidly what topics do you hope will be explored in a possible future tle special section on on this subject well there are many excellent contributions to this edition of uh, the leading edge uh, however given the rapid pace in of progress in this field i am sure we will revisit uh, many of these topics again uh, now there are way too many topics to really count here but there are some that really excite me at this point which include uh, gpu based acceleration of image processing and computation as you've seen how gpus are uh, really accelerating different 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 kinds of learning algorithms uh, to be able to extract all the information that we want to extract with the images that we have that's one exciting piece of technology that's evolving rapidly i am also interested how image computed properties can relate or can be related to actual physical lab measurements at uh, which are at measured at different scale altogether so what is the disconnect between image computed properties and lab measurements that's also one other interesting topic and perhaps some kind of a hybrid between image uh, analysis and understanding our in situ lab conditions it would be quite interesting in that regard also geologic scenario testing using process based four scale simulations is a very interesting topic traditionally we have we've imagined how the rock microstructure is with uh, for for flow properties we imagine pipes for elasticity we imagine ellipsoids in our head and try and model that effect but now because we have this ability to image the rock the way it really is and analyze that i see that there would be many possibilities now to really simulate that process at that scale 
and then see how different kinds of properties evolve to a larger scale. So that's a few, uh, few topics that I'm really curious how they might evolve in the next uh, decade or so. Within the papers present in, in this round of, spe- of the special section, was there one thing that surprised you or jumped out at you from the, the papers published? Well, quite a few things, I would say. But one thing that really jumped out uh, was how broad the field of image processing really is. And you see cross-pollination of ideas from one niche topic to another, which, uh, which can be a pleasant surprise, but is also difficult to plan or predict. It's not straightforward to say that this technology being developed uh, in this discipline might apply to that one. Uh, it's not always uh, obvious to make that connection. But that's really surprised me in many ways. I see that advancements made in computer vision or image processing algorithms for self-driving cars, as we spoke before, can help us segment clays or sub-resolution pores, which are not really easy to segment with the algorithms that we have. If it's a very clear resolved image, you can segment it, but if the if the pores sit below image resolution or the clays, which are difficult to segment, are below image resolution, can we segment them learning from the past experience? Of, uh, of segmenting these correctly. So that's the kind of topic that really excites me and has surprised me that there are so many cross-discipline uh, ideas being shared, but yet it's not, not obvious to pinpoint what those are. What do you hope readers of this special section will take away? Various authors demonstrate how image processing can help solve problems at various scales. We, we've seen papers which talk about imaging from nanoscale, microscale, to all the way to hundreds of meters with seismic. And the level of progress that we see is really promising, I would say. Uh, still, I think we are just getting started. As advancements in image processing combined with uh, improved domain knowledge of classical subsurface disciplines uh, will shape the future of this field. So I think one message to take away from it is that uh, stay tuned, there's more coming. And I would encourage anyone who is uh, looking at image processing or, or image analysis uh, domain to keep checking out the next few editions of The Leading Edge. There might be a, quite a few surprises. Is there anything you would like to share that I did not ask you? So one thing I would like to uh, talk about is that uh, the whole field of image processing is helping us uh, better understand problems at different scales, starting with uh, from nanometers to micrometers to meter scale. And that is uh, by itself a new phenomenon that's emerging, that we are able to extract information from images of different scales and being able to integrate all these images into a single cohesive picture of the subsurface. Uh, Often we work in our own uh, subdomains. A petrophysicist would look at uh, uh, images of micro scale or pore scale. A reservoir engineer or a geophysicist might be interested in a much larger scale, uh, meters long scale. But now because advancements are being made in imaging and image processing in different different sub-disciplines, at some point, these all will come together and we will have a much clearer picture of the subsurface going forward. So that's the optimism I would like to leave you with for the special section. Well, there's a lot of excitement in this field and a lot happening. And I, I thank you for sharing a, a bit of that and, and taking your time out today, Nishak, to, to talk about this. Thank you. Oh, you're most welcome, Andrew. Appreciate your time and effort into it. At seg.org slash podcast, you will find the show notes and links to the June articles. Subscribers can read the full articles online and abstracts are always free. If you enjoy the show, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Your review supports SEG to create new episodes. Subscribe to Seismic Sound Off on the podcast app of your choice to receive the latest episodes first. Seismic Sound Off is sponsored by the SEG Wiki, the place to find hundreds of biographies of geoscientists, open tutorials, and ongoing translations of SEG's best-selling book, Robert Sherris Encyclopedic Dictionary. 
Type wiki.seg.org into your browser to visit the world's first online geophysics encyclopedia. Original music by Zach Bridges. This episode was hosted, edited, and produced by me, Andrew Gary. Special thanks to the SEG podcast team. Jennifer Crockett, Beth Donica, Ali McGinnis, Mick Sweeney, and Adrian White. Shout out to Steve Brown for his assistance. Thank you for listening. This is Seismic Sound Off, signaling off.